Hello, we are MakeSense, a multidisciplinary research group at Aalborg University Hospital in Denmark who work within pain treatment and neurogastroenterology. We would like to tell you about the methods we use to examine the effects of opioid on the gastrointestinal tract, also known as opioid-induced bowel dysfunction. Opioid-induced bowel dysfunction is an umbrella term for the panintestinal side effects related to opioid treatment. It manifests in symptoms such as reflux, abdominal pain, bloating and opioid-induced constipation. It is the result of binding of opioids to opioid receptors throughout the gastrointestinal tract. This leads to gastrointestinal dysmotility, sphincter dysfunction and decreased secretion of water and electrolytes. The current pharmacological treatment options for opioid-induced bowel dysfunction can be divided into three subgroups conventional lactatives, prokinetics and secretagogues, and finally, opioid antagonists. Treatment with conventional lactatives is commonly recommended in all opioid-treated patients. However, evidence is lacking to suggest which, if any, of the conventional lactatives are appropriate in treatment of opioid-induced bowel dysfunction. Additionally, more than 50% of patients report unsatisfactory therapeutic effects and many have remaining symptoms despite being on two or more lactatives. Prokinetics and secretagogues are newer pharmacological treatment options which, like the conventional lactatives, exert their main effect in the colon, hereby being symptomatic treatments for the colonic side effects of opiates. In contrast, opiate antagonists target the underlying pathophysiology. But how do they exactly work? Let's take a closer look at the mechanism. Generally, opiate antagonists block the opiate receptors in the gut without reducing centrally mediated analgesia. Opiate antagonists are therefore a very promising drug class with many new drug candidates under development. There's different methods to assess how opioids affect motility patterns in the gastrointestinal tract. An example is the 3D transit system which consists of the abdominal belt containing the wireless receiver in the middle, a respiration belt and the magnetic capsule. The abdominal belt is mounted on the participant and so is the respiration belt. The magnetic capsule is provided to the participant and it is swallowed with a standardized meal. The 3D transit system can be worn at home, allowing the participant to leave the research facility. I would like to show you a screenshot from a typical 3D transit recording. In the upper left corner, we have a 2D plot of the anatomical position of the capsule. For example, we can see here the capsule entering the duodenum. Down here we have graphs representing the X, Y and Z coordinates of the capsule. And from these measures, we can calculate gastric, small intestinal and colonic transit times. This is another presentation of the same recording. Here we can see the capsule moving through the colon. And from these measurements we can estimate different motility patterns in the colon. For example, direction of pro progression and number of mass movements. We can also assess the impact of opioids on the anal sphincter by looking at the rectoanal inhibitory reflex, which is a reflex thought to be diminished by opioids. Here we insert a balloon in the rectum and a water-filled pressure catheter in the internal anal sphincter. When the balloon is inflated, the corresponding sphincter relaxation is measured using a computer with recording software. Another way to examine the anal sphincter is using the functional lumen imaging probe. It measures the geometric profile of the sphincter during distension and also the distensibility of the sphincter. Previous studies have not examined this sensibility during opioid treatment, so we don't know how it's affected by the treatment. Opioid treatment often affects the gastrointestinal tract and causes constipation. However, it can be time-consuming and difficult to evaluate the colon and assess constipation using conventional methods. For that purpose, we have developed 
a semi-automatic segmentation tool that quantifies colonic and fecal volume based upon magnetic resonance imaging. The method does not expose the patient to radiation and the scanning sequence is performed within a few minutes. We acquire two image series of the abdomen. One T2 weighted image series, which is used to evaluate colon volume, and one Dixon type image series, which shows the content of the colon. The image series consists of approximately 40 slices. In the T2 weighted image sequence, the colon wall is represented by dark intensity voxels. We delineate the outer boundaries of the colon wall and divide the colon in four segments. The cecum and ascending colon, the transverse colon, the descending colon, and the sigmoid colon and the rectum. Thereby, we can look into which segments that are mostly influenced by the constipation. The colon areas are segmented with a clustering method and non-colonic tissue is removed. The method gives an accurate quantification of volume and saves the observer time compared to delineating the whole colon. This was just a short introduction to some of the methods that we use to examine the gastrointestinal tract during different treatments and during different gastrointestinal diseases. Thank you for watching our video.